Okay, well, Johnny, I suppose a lot of people think we're wasting our time bothering with the free will issue. Most people assume that human beings have free will, of course. Uh, who would ever suggest anything else? And this is what got me so interested in your first book. Um, I wound up doing a little research on free will as part of a, a job, and I felt very trapped. Um, the predominant attitude in science and philosophy now seems to be determinism, and uh, because I'm a, a logical thinker and, and these... Um, you know, this scientific method and mm. scientific thinking has a lot of meaning to me and I want to follow it, but I followed it to the point where it was telling me that I had no free will and that none of my efforts or, or decisions that I had struggled to make in my life mattered because they were all predetermined and that got me really upset. Um, yes, it comes as a real shock in a sense to realize that in certain levels of science and philosophy, determinism is almost accepted as inevitable. And so maybe we can start by digging into why that's so a little bit. Um, well, there's a long history to this, eh? It dates back to Aristotle and earlier. Um, the problem essentially is a problem in logic. Um, the idea is that if... Um, it is true that all effects must have causes, then our thought process can't be an effect without a cause, right? Right. So, so science is tracing things back, finding more and more effects, um, or, or finding more and more causes for the effects that we see, saying, oh, you know, even behaviorally, well, we know that people who are, you know, uh, more... Um, conscientious uh, uh, openness yeah conscientious tend to vote you know Republican people who are more open to experience tend to vote liberal um, we know more about physics and you know how uh, particles are interacting yes perhaps this is something that most people could understand more readily the the, uh, the argument for material uh, determinism in physics is simply that <clears throat> if um, Newton's laws of physics are correct, and everybody assumes that, for the most part, at least within a limited context, they certainly are. Mm. Got us to the moon and back, after all. Right. Um, then, in fact, uh, all effects have mechanical causes. Um, and if, uh, actually, there was a, uh, um, a scientist... Um, uh, Laplace, who in the late 19th century, who um, advanced the idea that if there could be a demon who could know <clears throat> the speed and direction and all the qualities and all the aspects of every particle in the universe, it follows from Newtonian science that <clears throat> excuse me that demon could predict the future because just as a good pool player can predict where a ball is going to go when he hits it with a cue. So Laplace's demon could predict where every particle in the universe has to end up for all time because of the necessary relationships between right. all of the activity that's going on. <clears throat> it seems logically correct. How do we get out of it? And Laplace wasn't a dumb guy. Um... Uh, re I read up on him a little bit, and uh, I think he predicted the existence of black holes 50 <coughs> years before we had any mm. um, any way of measuring them or any way of detecting their mass in the universe. And, um, yeah, and, and if you don't like the demon, um, you could call it a supercomputer and just say, okay, sure. if there was a supercomputer, you know, that knew the, as you say, speed and direction of every particle then it could predict, you know, if you think of it, if we had it running on this room right now and it was looking at all of the particles that make up our body, then it could predict the next moment, the next moment, the next moment. Of course, it could predict the weather. Um, and ultimately, it, it could predict what I'm going to say next, even though I don't know what I'm going to say next, actually. Because your brain <coughs> is a physical... Haven't figured that out yet. Right, but, but <coughs> they would say that it could predict it because your brain is made up of matter. Yes. Matter is made up of physical properties, and so the laws of physics must apply to your brain. 
yes. just as they apply to billiard balls. As you put it in uh, our article, um, more and more <clears throat> it is uh, becoming a, an understood fact that um, the activities of brain are physical activities. Right. Um, and so in a way they're inseparable from Laplace's demons principle. Right. And so you get uh, Wagner, Daniel Wagner, who wrote The Illusion of Conscious Will. Um, yes. And he, he kind of playfully calls it, he says, oh, well, if you have free will, then you must in your brain somewhere have a free willer, uh, a little magical entity that is making decisions somehow that, that have nothing to do with the physical matter of your brain. And also, what is that free willer? Because it's not random, because random isn't free. Um, and we'll get into a bit of, you know, a bit of that. But, but you know, the, the question would be, even if you assume there was such a magical creature, how the heck is it making its decisions if its decisions aren't predicated on things that happened to you before? Mm. And ultimately, we don't believe in magical creatures anyway. Right, so, right. Um, we're stuck. So you don't get to have a free willer. So as you get deeper and deeper into this stuff, you say, okay, everything can be traced backward. Every effect has a cause. Everything that has happened can be traced backward. Uh, you know, and, and we did this. We, we mapped out how the universe came into being by mapping it backward to the Big Bang. And we saw mm -hmm. that, you know, the Big Bang went and then the L Newton's laws of physics, objects in motion remaining in motion, you know, um, these very billiard ball ways that things interact moved us forward through time, and, mm. and here we are. So, so to put the matter in, in simple terms once again, you could say, <clears throat> for instance, that I'm at a party and the host uh, is serving dessert and asks me, would I like uh, strawberry shortcake or a chocolate cake for dessert? I think for a second, I say, oh, I, I, I believe I'd like strawberry shortcake, thank you very much. Uh, <clears throat> and you think that you've made a free decision, that you've, you've actually made a decision on the basis of some kind of rational thought. <clears throat> well, it can easily be shown that you made that decision because uh, you're more fond of strawberries than you are of chocolate and you have no idea why, uh, that maybe you had too much chocolate cake yesterday and uh, subconsciously you feel a little turned off chocolate cake anyway. And so there are all kinds of subconscious reasons why <clears throat> you made that decision. And, but, and probably conscious thought played no part in it at all. And yet you suppose that it was a conscious decision. And we could go back further and say, oh, well, the strawberries, you know, when you were a child, you know, your mom brought you strawberries on that one particular day, and that had nothing to do with you. That's that right. wasn't your free will. You just had a pleasant day with strawberries when you were five years old. Yeah. And even though you don't remember it, um, that is still playing out in your, um, yes. in, in the in your brain. You know, the 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 literal physical structures, the myelin sheaths and the axons and dendrites have. Um, yeah. you know, created these memory associations around strawberries. Yes, and you're not aware of that. Right. Uh, it's not part of your rational processes at all, really. Um, now, there are people who would say, oh, well, that's all very well for strawberries and chocolate cake, but uh, can't possibly apply to uh, uh, major decisions like um, what am I going to uh, choose as my career in life and so on and so forth. The response to that is, mm, you think so, but... Okay? You just don't understand the complexity of it. Sure. I, I, at the age I'm at now, I'm realizing as much as I wanted to differentiate myself from my parents, I'm becoming more and more like my parents. And, and I'm, you know, I'm proud of that. I'm happy with it at this stage of my life. But, you know, as I age, um, uh, those influences are seeping in. And I would think about the same thing with career choices. You know, what did you hear? about a professor when you were young, or what did you hear about a psychologist when you were young that made you, you know, want to make that choice? And of course, none of this is free will. It's all stuff that just happened to us, um, you know, that made its way into our physical mm. brain, and now we're, we're reacting to it. So there are ways to understand, sort of in colloquial terms, uh, what determinism is all about. Um, the uh, the Laplace's demon argument, the strawberries and chocolate cake argument, these 
are simple enough and and uh, close enough to our or, nor, normal experience that ordinary people could understand them uh, for the most part. But there's a whole world of philosophical discourse on the subject as well, which is practically impenetrable to the average reader, the ordinary uh, people in life, um, stuff they would never bother with, but um, stuff to which in one way or another you have to be able to supply an answer if you're going to get us out of this mess. Right. And I, I do, I want to, I, I don't know if you want to get into some of the philosophical angles. I want to get just quickly the emotional side of it for me. It really was like, this is, it's a trap, you know, and you fall into it and you go, oh man, like nothing I have ever tried to do, nothing I was ever proud of, nothing I have, you know, struggled through and, and you know, sat there and, and, you know, beat my head against a wall and wondered about and tried to figure out. None of it matters. Uh, if you're a determinist, because it was all going to happen anyway. So life becomes this um, huge amount of struggle, you know, life is suffering, if you if you like the Buddhist um, uh, maxim, mm. um, for nothing, because what are we achieving through any of that struggling? We're just going to do what we're going to do anyway. So, so again, very upsetting. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and it has very practical implications as well. For instance, our entire legal system uh, rests on the assumption that people uh, can be held responsible for their actions. Uh, now, this is mitigated in one way or another to some degree. Uh, our court, courts do recognize that uh, there are forms of insanity, there are forms of, um, of uh, irrationality, um, mental illness of one kind or another that can cause people to do things which normally they would not wish or want to do uh, and which are considered irresponsible and anti antisocial and uh, worthy of punishment mm. in some form. Mm. Um, but for the most part the whole system rests on, on the assumption that ordinary people can in their day-to-day -day life be held responsible for their actions. Determinism says well, no, in fact, they're not. Um, so then sh we shouldn't punish anybody for anything and we shouldn't hold anybody accountable for anything? Is that the, is that the determinist logic? Well, yes, but in a way, there's something deeply and fundamentally illogical about the whole determinist position because you just said, for instance, we shouldn't hold people responsible we shouldn't punish, and so on. If you apply the principle of hard determinism rigorously, there's no point in such a statement, because what do you mean by we shouldn't do something? Should or shouldn't implies a conscious choice, right. a moral stance of one kind or another. Right. If everything is in fact predetermined, then we are nothing but automatons. We, we don't actually make any decisions about what should or shouldn't be done. We merely fool ourselves that we did. And there are, I think there are equally, you know, comedians and uh, works of literature, you could say better than I could, but where people say, you know, God, what are you doing trying to hold me accountable for my actions, you know, telling me that I'm going to go to heaven or hell based on what I do, when didn't you create me to begin with? Isn't God... Laplace's demon or, or the supercomputer that knows everything and so how can you have um, you know this possibility of knowing the future for any entity to know the future but also have uh, any kind of free will or, or be accountable or responsible for any kind of your actions it, it's quite the paradox yes and uh, as a matter of fact it has had very deep and very uh, disturbing social consequences. We, we think that this is all a rarefied philosophical discussion, but in fact, uh, particularly in theology, this has always been a huge problem. How do you reconcile the idea of an omnipotent and an omniscient God with the idea of free will? John Calvin said you can't. And John Calvin founded a, a branch of religion which has um, uh, branches today that are still followed. Um, it's interesting. Uh, 
uh, there's a novel, barometer, not barometerizing, but Each Man's Son by Hugh McClannan, okay. in which he takes on this whole subject and shows how, in fact, Calvinism ruins people's lives. Real people, ordinary people in the street, who believe things uh, which the Calvinist religion um, states, and consequently, well, for instance, Ellen Montgomery's husband, she married a, the, the author of um, Anne of Green Gables, oh, yeah. married a Presbyterian minister. Presbyterianism is a, an offshoot of Calvinism. And he slowly went mad because he was convinced that he was not amongst the elect, that in spite of anything he could do, he was going to go to hell. And he was right. He was not amongst the elect because there is no elect. The whole theory is wrong. But he went crazy anyway. Trying to... Trying to solve this problem. Trying to find a way out of this horrible black hole that he had discovered. All the responsibility of John Calvin, probably one of the most evil men in history, in my view. Sure. <laughs> so, so here we are. We're in a we're in a <clears throat> black hole. Um, we have no control over our decisions. Nothing that we we think or do or try to do matters. Okay. So the end. We're done. Right. <laughs> our whole business, a, eh, is that we think there's a way out, um, and that's why we've written this article. Um, and <clears throat> the 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 door uh, out of the prison was opened, I believe, by chaos and complexity theory, uh, a new branch of science that has arisen from um, computer science, essentially, from the invention of computers and our, our uh, insight into how computers fundamentally operate and do the marvelous things that they do. <clears throat> and there's no question that in one sense or another, it's valid to compare the human brain to a supercomputer of some kind. We know that it operates um, on electricity, right? Yeah. A synapse is actually uh, a biological um, uh, switch. So it is valid to, at least in metaphorical terms, to draw analogies between uh, the operation of the brain and the operation of a computer. And computers have taught us a number of things about how um, complex uh, effects emerge in reality. Um, it's, a <laughs> uh, it's a subject that we uh, never thought of before computers arrived on the scene. Um, Perhaps uh, we could um, mention at the moment uh, Terence Deacon's article uh, that we built on in our article, which um, sets out a series of levels of uh, complex emergence. Uh, the idea of emergence is central to uh, the whole modern insight into uh, how computers run and the things they do. Um, and uh, it, uh, it arises out of the development of chaos theory and subsequently of complexity theory. Do you want to... Uh, how did chaos and complexity theory come about? Um, because we started talking about Newtonian presuppositions where, um, you know, physics are like billiard balls, and you mentioned that was good enough to get us to the moon and good enough to explain, you know, the origins of the universe. So why on earth would we change, why on earth would we deviate from using just Newtonian presuppositions? Um, why... What does chaos and complexity theory have to add? Well, uh, I get interested in chaos and complexity theory uh, a number of years ago, uh, basically because I picked up uh, in a bookstore uh, on the remainder rack a, uh, a book by James Gleick, 
on chaos theory. And um, uh, I thumbed through it and was immediately hooked and bought it for $5 and my life was changed. Um, chaos theory is a very interesting development that arises from computer science, basically. Um, perhaps a good way to introduce the idea is to talk about uh, the butterfly effect, yeah. which is uh, it's a phrase that has become sufficiently well-known that means something to most people. Um, the butterfly, uh, butterfly effect, so-called, arose uh, from experiments done by uh, meteorologists attempting to develop computer programs to predict the weather. Now, as a matter of fact, we do use com computer programs to predict the weather a great deal today, and they're quite effective over a very short term. Um, the reason why uh, a meteorologist today can tell you that a uh, snowstorm in Nova Scotia is going to start as snow and change to rain uh, at two o'clock in the afternoon and lo and behold it does change to rain at two o'clock in the afternoon uh, and is able to tell you this the night before is because he's using computer programs. Basically what these programs are doing is um, taking a lot of data about previous weather systems and uh, looking at a very long history of all the data that we've collected and uh, Averaging. So that uh, sounds like Newtonian physics in play, is. though. It is. Okay. What that computer program can't do is to tell you what the weather is going to be like a week from now. It's always wrong to one degree or another. Um, now, meteorologists discovered the reason why it is always wrong and discovered that there's nothing you can do about that. It's called the butterfly effect. And, and the issue is this. If you, uh, predicting the weather involves collecting data from the environment. How much data do you have to have in order to predict the weather accurately? The answer is, you have to have all the data. So it's those darn butterflies messing yeah. it up. Yeah. If even a butterfly flaps its wings and you don't know about it, that could change a pattern 10 days down the road. The way in which they came to realize this was because a, a computer, uh, a meteorologist was, was running a, a, a model computer program one day um, and uh, decided, I, I think what happened was he decided he wanted to have a closer look at a, uh, at, uh, a certain sequence in the, uh, in the run. And so he started it over again and uh, let it run and went off to lunch and came back uh, an hour later to see what it developed. And lo and behold, it had produced an entirely different prediction uh, from the one he expected. So, he said, oh my God, I must have put the daddy in wrong somehow or other. So he went back and checked it over, couldn't find any error. Eventually discovered that the problem was that he'd rounded off a figure from five decimal places to four decimal places or something like that. Right. And ultimately it produced an entirely different pattern. And it suddenly hit him we're never going to be able to predict the weather because there's so many little factors that we can't know that are going to be more influential than that rounding off of a ten thousandth to a thousandth. Right. So maybe you think of that as the butterfly, that tiny yeah. little rounding yeah. way down the decimal chain. Yeah. And, uh, and that led to an entirely different system. So you might, you can get the weather accurately the next day. A week out, maybe but you can get the further down the road you go, the more every tiny little uh, change that occurred will uh, conceivably produce a different result. Right. As a matter of fact, this principle had been discovered by a, a French mathematician in the late 19th century, but nobody paid any attention to him because it didn't matter very much. Is that Poincaré? Yeah, Poincaré. Okay. Um, and... Uh, uh, he had discovered in running various kinds of mathematical formula that, in fact, this effect occurs. Right. Now, you can ask, well, how much real practical effect does that have in ordinary life? Um, but, uh, and, and of course, um, I once, for instance, received a, uh, 
uh, a flyer from um, uh, an economics uh, magazine, uh, which featured a big butterfly uh, on the uh, face of the flyer with the caption, uh, when a butterfly flaps its wings, it can cause a tornado somewhere else in the world. And then, of course, their cute little uh, metaphor was that they are the source of little bits of important information that really are going to have a big impact down the road. Uh-huh. Uh, in fact, it isn't true to say that when a butterfly flaps it wing its wings, it can cause a tornado somewhere else in the world because there's so many other factors that work there as well. Uh, for instance, various kinds of... Um, what are called in chaos theory strange attractors. They're ways in which complex systems limit themselves uh, will mean that uh, a butterfly flapping its wings is not going to cause a tornado in Fredericton because they don't have tornadoes in Fredericton. Uh, they never develop there and so on. Um, <clears throat> also, in the real world, there are so many insects flapping their wings that the effect really does get hugely diluted. Um, there are a fairly limited number of factors in any computer program that you could produce. Right. You could count them. You can't go up and count the number of insects flapping their wings in the world. Right. Um, so we're dealing with huge complexity in the real world by comparison to anything that you can model. Isn't this all still Newtonian, though? Couldn't uh, Laplace's demon or, you know, a super supercomputer still take all that data and figure it out if it did know, you know, where all the butterflies and crickets were? Uh, this would be the argument. But in fact, there's, a, there's another step uh, which, computer, uh, which uh, complexity theory uh, reveals. And th that is that... Um, there are levels of complex phenomena which uh, then depend on previous levels. Um, the easiest way to, to put it, the, the way it's often put in uh, uh, ordinary terms is that a complex emerging process is more than the sum of its parts. Um, there's, there has, Newtonian science tends to be reductionist and it makes the assumption that um, all complex phenomena um, are the result of the adding together of particular parts. Right. Uh, that in fact any complex phenomena is, in fact, the sum of its parts. And this has resulted in a kind of science um, which examines the parts very closely, but tends to assume that the more complex phenomena can easily be figured out just by adding parts together, but what you've got to know is the parts. So let's try an example. Um, We've, we've discussed a flock of birds. We've discussed uh, star formation. Uh, flock of birds is a good example. Okay. Um, you've maybe been at a beach and seen a flock of sandpipers take off in those incredible sheets of birds that move and turn and the light reflects off them in a different way, like a magic flying carpet. Yeah. What on earth is a flock of birds? And could you find out what it is by examining individual birds? you can pretty quickly come to the conclusion, no, I doubt if I could find out what a flock is by examining individual birds. A flock is something that birds do together, and if I'm going to understand a flock, I'm going to under, have to understand how they interrelate, not simply what a bird is, right? Um, in fact, a flock is a complex emergent phenomenon, and it is more than a bunch of birds added together. It takes on a new entity that runs by a new set of rules and all the rest of it. Now, a, um, a computer scientist actually has figured out a way of modeling um, flocks on the television screen or on the computer screen. And it has uh, three very simple rules, something like, um, don't quote me on this, but something like, um, 
check the center of mass of the group of birds, uh, check the speed and direction of the bird nearest to you, uh, always move towards the center of mass. Um, and if you put these three directives in, have all your uh, little bird models obey those three rules, yeah. um, suddenly they will form flocks fly around objects and come together again, do all kinds of amazing things on the screen that look like a flock of birds, but they're only obeying three simple rules, which are known in the computer world as an algorithm. Right. And uh, that algorithm suddenly produces a completely new entity called a flock. You couldn't find that algorithm by examining an individual bird. Uh, so when you say we needed uh, computer science to understand chaos and complexity as opposed to Newtonian physics, mm -hmm. this is kind of an example, right? Newton could have sat there with an individual bird for as long as he wanted and, you know, poked at yeah. it and prodded and measure its, its velocity and its direction. Yes, and you would never have learned anything about flock. Right. Uh, fish do the same thing in schools, of course. And uh, so, so you need <laughs> that computer model and you need to be able to combine a thousand of these... Right. Birds together. And it was Craig Reynolds, right? Boys? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. That's right. Craig um, <laughs> you need to be able to combine a thousand of them together and see how they, they interact and move. Sorry, yeah. I, I cut you off. So, Fish. No, that's good. So um, what this tells us is that real complex phenomena are in some meaningful way more than the sum of their parts. Now, there's a philosophical... Uh, theory as well. I mean, we can, we can cite Newtonian science and the fundamentally reductionist approach of Newtonian science and say <clears throat> that it is a, um, a matter of examining the parts and assuming that any complex structure is going to be the sum of the parts. In philosophy, the argument is called snollism, and it assumes that um, any uh, complex philosophical you are examining can be reduced to an understanding of the smallest contributing factors. There's a fun example of this. We haven't actually talked about this one, but I heard about it recently. Um, because the birds, when they flock, that's adaptive, right? They, they, they do it and it makes adaptive sense evolutionarily um, be in avoiding predators, in surrounding bugs, um, the example that I heard was uh, zebras, uh, that they wanted to study, uh, you know, some individual, you know, zebra behavior. And so they're trying to measure, you know, how often does it bend over and chew grass and how often does it take a step? And the researchers kept getting confused because they would look down and they would look up and they couldn't track which zebra they were looking at, which of course is the effect of the stripes yeah. of a zebra within the herd of zebras. So they said, okay, well, we'll solve this drive up to one, put a strip of red paint on it. And what happened when they did that was that when the predator, when the lion came along, it would, it would kill the zebra with the strip of red paint on it because that was the one that it was able to differentiate mm -hmm. from the rest of the zebras. So the, the camouflage that evolved for the zebras, probably very much in the same way as the flocking behavior evolved for the birds, serves this interesting adaptive purpose, be it in escaping predators, surrounding prey, um, somehow that, that uh, emergent uh, phenomenon that is more than the sum of its parts, like a zebra in a herd is more than just a zebra on its own, because when it's in a herd you can't see it because of its coloration. And mm. a bird in a flock is more than a bird on its own, because when it's in the flock it's moving with this mass that you know, manages mm. to surround Something, like, something like that is the explanation of why this behavior developed evolutionarily. Great. Yeah. Uh, now, it's a practical example of how uh, a complex emergent phenomenon is more than the sum of its parts. Um, how do we get from that to uh, anything to do with uh, free will? That's uh, yes. a very interesting uh, yes. question. Well, uh, there was an article... Uh, published by Terence Deacon in a, uh, a collection of articles, uh, a collection of essays by Oxford University Press a few years ago titled The Emergence, The Reemergence of Emergence. 
And uh, the very publication of that book is, uh, is a good example of the impact that the whole uh, matter of chaos and complexity theory is having on thought today. Um, Terence Deacon sets out uh, various levels of emergent phenomena that occur because of various things that happen in chaos and complexity theory, like uh, phase transition and uh, um, critical mass and so on and so forth. <clears throat> um, he set out three fundamental levels, which uh, uh, he called thermodynamic emergence. Thermodynamic emergence occurs because it has to, due to the rules of Newtonian science. Uh, a good example uh, that we can use to illustrate this whole thing is the evolution of uh, the sun and the solar system in the history of the universe. Uh, suns originally uh, emerged uh, because of the necessary activity of um, matter obeying the rules of gravity and so on. Uh, uh, to put it very simply, and admittedly this is an oversimplification, but to put it very simply, the matter of the original universe was not entirely uniform. Therefore, it tended to be somewhat clumped. Those clumps began to collapse on themselves because of the gravitational forces operating within them. Uh, larger clumps attracted smaller clumps, and so on and so forth. And gradually these things collapsed on themselves, collapsed on themselves, heated up, began to revolve because of the uh, conservation of uh, angular momentum, and so on and so forth. And as that mass of um, hydrogen, basically, collapses on itself and begins to rotate, it begins to heat up, eventually you get a controlled nuclear explosion going on there, which we call a sun. The thing emerged because of thermodynamic necessities. Now, the universe is not composed uh, simply of a bunch of suns scattered evenly throughout space. I remember this moment of, I had a breakthrough, I was on campus at work, and I, I uh, don't know if I emailed or called you, in my mind I called you, I said, Andy, why isn't the universe uniform? You know, if, if, if it all came from a point of infinite density, all this matter went out into the world, shouldn't it, shouldn't have, like, shouldn't it have just all stayed a giant mass of dust? How did some of it decide to accrete onto other parts? And if it was going to accrete onto other parts, why isn't it perfectly symmetrical? Shouldn't it be a, you know, a, a grid pattern or a kaleidoscope or something? Like, it, it seems awfully... Chaotic. You know, there you go. Yeah, <laughs> as a, you know, because how would it decide to accrete? It should just be a big puff, a big circular puff of dust, right? Yeah, as a matter of fact, this is a major problem for modern theoretical physics, uh, which, which they're working on today. Why was it that, in fact, the universe acquired any particular causal structure at all? As a matter of fact, that's a very important idea with relation to the whole idea of free will, because um, it turns out that uh, in terms of, of the universe, you can't necessarily trace back the causal structure of every little thing that happens today to some uh, prime mover. Uh, it turns out that the prime mover um, really shouldn't have had all these effects at all anyway if you're simply dealing it w with it in terms of Newtonian science. Uh, as you say, it should have produced a fairly simple pattern. Right. Um, well, Terence Deacon, uh, using chaos and complexity theory, suggests that, first of all, you have this thermodynamic emergence, and then you get something called morphodynamic, or which he calls morphodynamic uh, emergence. Okay. And that is due to the random distribution of materials. Um, you get uh, suns developing uh, solar systems, and we've learned a lot about solar systems in the last decade. Um, 25 years ago, we didn't know whether any other sun had a solar system. Today, it's pretty much accepted that virtually all suns have solar systems. Okay. Um, because we've discovered any, any sun 
that we've been able to examine closely enough through uh, the latest astrophysical techniques uh, appears to have planets of some kind. Secondly, every last one of them is different. Uh, there appear to be no two solar systems the same, as far as we can tell so far. And, moreover, uh, the particular features of our solar system with some small rocky planets uh, closer to the sun and some big gaseous planets farther away is quite unusual and difficult to explain. It seems to have occurred because one of the big planets uh, went a bit AWOL and wandered in too close to the sun at some point and, and uh, caused the kind of disturbance that accidentally resulted in some rocky planets hanging out close to the sun. I don't know exactly how it works, but the theory is that it was the result of a very peculiar and uh, probably even unique uh, accident of a morphodynamic kind. What Terence Deacon means by morphodynamics is that uh, forms beget forms, beget forms, beget forms, because of random effects which uh, enter the picture. And so this is why when you say a lot of suns have solar, syst solar systems around them, but they're all, you know, fairly unique, because again, it's the same argument. You would think that if it was just matter clumping together in some predictable manner based on the laws of Newtonian physics, even once you get within a solar system, shouldn't they all kind of look the same? Yeah. Because yeah. It's, it's just physics, right? You right. know, you hit a billiard ball... If you hit the same billiard ball on ten different tables in the exact same manner, and the balls are all the same, the same thing should happen. Right. Uh, but what we're seeing here is that the same thing doesn't happen at these large scales. Um, unique things uh, seem to happen. Now, a philosopher will ask you what you mean by randomness. Uh, uh, that, uh, in fact, if you go back to Laplace's uh, demon and that argument... Uh, there is nothing that's truly random. It only looks random to you. Uh, but in fact, there's a, there's a different way of looking at it once you come to understand the complex interrelationships of things as described by chaos and complexity theory. Uh, and I use a bingo ball machine as an example. Okay. Um, there are two major factors that are going to determine what bingo ball uh, ends up being uh, picked by the caller and, and called. Um, let's say our machine uh, is a whole bunch of bingo balls, they're light, there's a strong fan on the bottom of it that blows them all around, they rattle around in the box, and there's a catchment mechanism on the side of the box, and balls tend to fall into that catchment mechanism and the caller then tips it out, picks it up, sees what numbers on it, calls it. Now, there are obviously reasons why a certain ball falls into the catchment at a certain time, and uh, in Laplacian terms, you could figure that out and trace it back quite a ways. It's gonna be, it's gonna be determined by the number of balls in the box, the size of the box, the weight of the balls, the force of the fan, a whole bunch of stuff like that. Right but it will necessarily result in a certain ball falling into that catchment. Newtonian physics. At a certain time. Yeah. Now, there are also a bunch of reasons why um, the bingo caller will tip the catchment out and take a ball at a certain time. Depends on when he started calling, how often he calls, uh, when he was distracted by a member of the audience who called him a nasty name, and so on and so forth. Um, so there's a whole complex bunch of causes that are going to determine when the caller will actually pick up the ball. Right. There are another whole bunch, as I said, that are going to determine when a certain ball will fall into that catchment. Right. But you can understand that it would be utterly impossible to trace out why, or what the connection would be between a member of the audience calling the bingo caller a dirty name and 
uh, how strong the fan was blowing that agitated the balls. The two things had nothing to do with each other, and they genuinely have nothing to do with each other. You may be able to trace the causal structures behind those things back a ways, yeah. but at a certain point, the causal structures become so huge, so complex, that they begin to verge on infinity. And it makes no sense at all, and most mathematicians and physicists will admit that it makes no sense at all to argue that a particular effect has an infinite number of causes. It's not something that mathematics can deal with. It's not something that appears to be rationally sensible. Um, it can't be true. A particular effect cannot have an infinite number of causes. So we can't trace, um, you know, this, this loose hair on my shirt. We can't trace that back to the Big Bang. I wouldn't think so. Okay. <laughs> it doesn't... It, it, it becomes obvious, once you understand something about complexity theory, that the sources of any particular causal structure are simply far too complex to allow for that kind of interrelationship. Um, ultimately, you start knocking on the door of infinity, and at that point, it's not making sense to you anymore. And is this just human limitation, though? That, you know, the fact that I can't regress back to infinity doesn't mean that physical, you know, physical reality can't regress back to infinity. But then we, we get into that same argument of, of um, if our Newtonian physics are correct and we're going to regress everything back to infinity, then why isn't everything, you know, uniform and parallel and, and just a big old ball of dust? Logically, we can posit that an effect could have an infinite number of causes. Right. And we can even argue that it's obvious that it does. But in fact, the, even the idea of infinity is a purely abstract idea. There may be nothing in reality which can be described as infinity. It could be that reality has ultimate limitations. Um, and that those limitations are going to provide an, uh, a final divide between uh, why the bingo caller called when he did and why the ball dropped when it did. And we, we have some examples in the paper where infinity is just kind of nonsense when you try to apply it in real terms. So Zeno's uh, yes. uh, Achilles versus the, the, the... or Achilles versus the tortoise, or, you know, he... he I think it was just Achilles versus... Well, oh, it was. It was Achilles versus the Tortoise. Let's use that as an example okay. uh, at the moment. The, the, the basic argument is that uh, if you look at a race between Achilles and the Tortoise purely mathematically, yeah. you can say that, uh, let's say the Achilles gives the Tortoise a head start yeah. of 100 yards. Yeah. After a certain length of time... Achilles is going to have caught up with uh, that tortoise by half the distance between. They're going to be 50 yards apart. Yeah. Now, mathematically, you can keep on doing that. You, you, you can say that after a certain length of time, that distance will have been divided in half. And after another length of time, that distance will, will have been divided up by half. If I set out from Halifax to Truro, at one point I'm halfway there. Uh, then divide that in half, I'm three quarters of the way there, divide that in half, and so on and so forth. You get closer and closer to Toro, but mathematically you cannot arrive. So long as there's any distance left between you and Toro, it can be divided in half again. You, so my fingers can never touch no. if I'm moving them together, because yeah. I have to keep going in by half. But in fact, they do touch. In they fact, do. I said I'd go to Toro, I get there. Right. How do you explain this? The answer is so simple that it should give you a start. The answer is, I believe, that the idea of dividing a distance in half is only an abstract idea. Nothing of the sort occurs in reality. When you travel from Halifax to Truro, you do not divide distances in half. You just travel. That's all. Dividing distances in half is an abstract mathematical concept which, in fact, has no direct relationship in reality whatsoever. 
So the so we're saying that this applies to the notion of infinite regression. Is that yeah, yeah. It, it, an infinite number of regressions is an abstract concept that clearly does not play itself out in the real universe because otherwise it would just all be dust and and we wouldn't and, and, yeah we wouldn't be sitting here coming now, up with theories. I I developed another idea. It seems to me that. Uh, our traditional way of thinking of causal structures, particularly the notion of tracing them back to a prime mover, suggests that, and we produce a little diagram in the article, okay, uh, we put a bunch of circles on the chart and, and trace them back with cones to all to a starting point. Yeah. And say that's the traditional way of looking at causation. Yeah. It's a prime mover and then it all spreads out from there. Yeah. So you could, in fact, theoretically, trace it all back to the prime mover where your Laplace's demon sits and he can see the whole system. Yeah. He knows what will happen. Yeah. In fact, that's not the way it works. It just isn't. The butterfly effect tells us that when you look back, a particular effect will not have a single cause. It will have, let's say, for simplicity's sake, two causes. But those two causes each have two causes. Right. And those four causes, each have two causes. We've now got eight causes involved. Very quickly, we've gone to infinity. So in fact, the chart ought to look like a bunch of points, which are the effects, and a bunch of cones that spread out and intermingle uh, in what I call an infinite potential. They don't cone back to a prime mover, they spread out to infinity. So, in fact, once you've gone back a certain distance, there's no way to tell where that cone starts. And so, when you take, um, you know, this notion of complex emergent phenomena, like we were talking mm. about with the flock of birds, or the school of fish, or the formation of a, of a star from dust, or the random elements that would mm. cause a solar system to rotate around a star, at a certain point, there are, there are genuinely... Um, you know, random, stochastic uh, elements mm. that are contributing yeah. to these causes yeah. that cannot be reduced to the sum of, of their parts. So things are kind of leveling up to a point where you can't determine the behavior of the flock of birds based on, you know, the thousand individual birds that make it up. So the, the emergent phenomenon level on top of each other um, to the point where you can't go back past them anymore, really, um, to their causes. Yeah. Um, let's go back to Terence Deacon's um, um, three types of emergence. We yep. had thermodynamic. We were talking about morphodynamic emergence, then things that, things that uh, occur, well, to use our example of solar systems, every solar system turns out to be different because, in fact, there were a huge number of random factors involved in um, developing the particular conditions that that produced a small planet here and a large planet here and so on and so forth. Uh, now, he goes on to describe a third level of emergence, which he calls teleodynamic. Yeah. Now, teleo means purposeful. Okay. And he uses a metaphor of a um, uh, the hole at the center of a wheel, at the hub of a wheel, which in a sense determines the entire uh, shape and purpose of the wheel. The hole turns on an axle, so to speak, and that's why a wheel works and why you bother having them. But the hole is nothing in itself. Okay. And so he's suggesting that there's a sense in which a nothingness can uh, produce a trend or produce a, uh, a um, suggested direction. I don't think the metaphor really works very well. It's hard to explain even. Um, in fact, uh, the way he puts it is there seems to be a a pull from the future when you find uh, when you find a complex emergent system 
that appears to have a purpose. Okay. Now, you look at the you look at the distribution and size of the planets in our solar system, that appears to have no apparent purpose. It's, it's just purely accidental and random. Right. I mean, you could have had a big planet near the sun, and a little little rocky planet out further and so on. They could have been in any arrangement. And just looking at the arrangement doesn't seem to serve any particular purpose. That's the way it is. And in fact, it doesn't. It's purely accidental. But you look at certain things in nature... Uh, for instance, like a giraffe's long neck, it appears to, to have a purpose. Um, but it wasn't a preconceived purpose in the sense that we normally think of the world, in the sense that a, an engineer would plan the way a machine works and then build it to work that way. A giraffe didn't get a long neck that way. Um, uh, but he calls this phase of emergence teleodynamic because it appears to have a purpose. Okay. Now, it struck me that, yes, that's all very well, but in fact, that's not the way uh, Darwinian evolution works. Darwinian evolution is expedient and serendipitous, right? It, it capitalizes on accidental developments, as so, far as we can understand it. So a giraffe with a slightly longer neck was able to reach slightly higher leaves, survived yep. a little longer, had a yep. few more babies, right. All and so its babies got longer and longer necks. Yeah. Okay. It, gradually, the form of the giraffe changes because it's driven by uh, expedient, by the capitalization of expedient uh, accidental um, genetic mutations. Got it. Okay. So we have... So... Thermodynamics is, is physics uh, in action, sort of the, yeah. the property of accretion into a star. Yeah. To use the examples we're sticking with. Morphodynamics is a little bit of randomness. It um, involves randomness, and so it results in incredible variety. Uh, such as our, our many different solar systems that yeah. we have in the universe. Uh, expodynamics... The name that you gave it? Well, yeah. So it occurred to me that you could describe Darwinian evolution better with a name like expedynamics, meaning expedient dynamics. Right. Because that's really the way it works. Uh, it's not actually teleo at all. Right. In other words, it's not designed in terms of a purpose. Okay. It simply turns out to have a purpose because it capitalized on, on uh, expedient uh, developments. So it's a different kind of leveling up because it's different from the basic physics that create a star. It's not purely random like the rotate like the the shape no. of a solar system. It's it's something that was adaptive in its environment yeah. and so it was kind of selected for over time. So it's yeah, it's because as you certain, say expedient because certain accidental developments were expedient. And that makes it a different kind of complex emergent phenomenon yeah. from uh morpho or uh Thermo. Thermodynamic, yeah. morphodynamic, expedynamic. Ex expedynamic now. All right. So we still have uh, Terence Deacon's term teleodynamic, and the question is, is there a realm of, of emergence which, in fact, is truly teleo, truly purposeful? The answer is, of course there is. What is it? It's human civilization. Um... You can get a giraffe's long neck by XP dynamics, but you don't get a Gothic cathedral that way. You don't get an airplane. You don't get a cell phone. There's no way a cell phone was ever going to evolve by Darwinian evolution, right? Right. It evolves because somebody thought of an idea in advance and then tried to apply it. Uh, in other words, it's, purpo it's genuinely purposeful. Now, teleodynamics, therefore, is just another name for free will. It's the... Pr and to put it the other way, free will really is just teleodynamics. It's, it's uh, a level of complex emergence which is more than the sum of its parts and which is directed by a preconceived purpose. Now, how do you preconceive purposes? It requires a human mind. What is a human mind doing when it preconceives purposes? 
if in fact it were simply following the law of cause and effect, it could not get beyond Darwinianism. That's what Darwinianism does. It follows the law of cause and effect, right? Right. You couldn't get beyond that. You could never actually create a realm of teleodynamic emergence if, in fact, uh, people like philosophers like Ted Hondrich, who believe in hard determinism, are right in saying that uh, human thought is purely a matter of a mechanical process of effects following mechanical causes. Now, do we have to introduce a magical uh, element in order to get to that next level? Our free willer. Uh, Daniel free Wagner's free, magical free, free willer. Yeah. Free willer. <laughs> My answer is no, you don't. Because complex uh, emergence, the principle of uh, a complex phenomena being more than the sum of its parts gives us an explanation of what a human conscious thought is. It's not merely the sum of the activities that, that uh, a brain engages in. It jumps to another level. Now, you may say, oh, well, all right, but you haven't really explained anything when you said that. You've just, you've just offered us a metaphor. Uh, it's the hard question of consciousness, ultimately, what David Chalmers calls, causes the, calls the hard question of consciousness. A brain may be able to do all kinds of fantastic things, like a computer can, and like an imagined supercomputer could, but how does it ever arrive at the point of knowing that it is doing it? And in the answer to that lies the ultimate answer to the secret of free will because the reason why we are able to preconceive purposes is because we're conscious of doing so. If we weren't conscious, there'd be no such thing as preconception. Well, <laughs> it seems to me that whether we understand the ultimate mechanics of how consciousness comes into being, there's no avoiding the obvious fact that we possess it. And there's no point in denying that we possess it. Uh, hard determinists don't try to deny the fact of consciousness. They simply ignore it. Hmm. Um, they don't explain it. Hmm. And, and they don't explain it away. Um, and so ultimately, uh, there's, our, um, uh, there's our rebuttal. Um, you can't possibly be sure that hard determinism is correct and prove it to me any more than I can possibly be sure that free will is correct and prove it to you. But I'm telling you the door's open to a genuine explanation of free will. And until we can thoroughly understand consciousness, you can't explain away free will. And so there are some ways that we, we talk about consciousness uh, or, or, you know, that, that psychological research has treated consciousness that, that begin to map onto uh, our argument, which is kind of reassuring because we've come at this from one angle. Um, but within psychology, uh, you can come at it from, uh, let's say, two more angles uh, to, to kind of corroborate with the physics of, of complex emergent phenomena. Um, one of the good arguments against free will um, for the determinists was put forward by uh, David Eagleman in Incognito. He said, well, mm. wait a minute. Tennis players are reacting so quickly, uh, pro tennis players in a pro tennis match are reacting so quickly that they can't think fast enough to do the things that they're doing. We know, uh, you know, how long it, you know, very approximately, but we, we know 
how fast uh, signals travel within the mm. brain, and, and they say, you know, you can't react fast enough um, to uh, be consciously thinking it through when you're returning a tennis, uh, mm. you know, serve in a very fast match. Therefore, you must be an automaton. And Benjamin Lebet. Um, yeah, you were explaining Benjamin Lebet's experiments to me, and that gave me a start at first. Yeah. I thought, ooh, how do we get around that one? Uh, just briefly explain to us what Benjamin Lebet discovered. And it's important to say that this wasn't <clears throat> his conclusion, but this is the way that the determinists yeah. played his conclusion. Yeah. Was to say um, he, he had the people hooked up to. Um, brain scans, um, and we have a couple different kinds of, of brain scans, and, and I'll, I'll get into that. But he would say, okay, I want you to choose to move your finger um, at a particular time, you know, in the next two minutes or so. <clears throat> and what you would see was um, eventually, you know, let's say after a minute and 12 seconds, the person would move their finger. But before they moved their finger, you would see this ramp up of cognitive activity that indicated that they were about to move their finger. And so before they could do it, and before they could say that they were going to do it, you began to see the causes, you know, the, the physical uh, activity ramp up in the brain predicting it. And so... And this um, was all picked up by brain scans of one kind or another. I exactly, know. yeah. And, and so one <clears throat> argument for that would be to say, well... Before you even know you're going to do something, we can detect it um, mm. coming into existence in your brain. And that's pre-conscious. So how are you going to tell me that you're the one who made the decision when I can say that, you know, it happened physically inside your brain uh, yeah. before it happened? Uh, now, let me get this straight. Basically, the, <clears throat> the, um, the subject is instructed to press a button on a computer at a random time yeah and simply make a conscious decision i'm going to do it now yeah and their brain is all being observed by brain scan stuff electroencephalogram yeah yeah all that stuff and uh what they discovered was in spite of the fact that the individual himself doesn't know when he's going to press that button and hasn't made any rational decision about when to press that button. And he's been specifically instructed not to do so. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> he said, just press it voluntarily. Yeah. <clears throat> the, the brain scans will show that prior to his making that decision and doing it, activity has ramped up in the motor section of his brain, which is going to perform the action. So in fact, when he thought that he made a conscious decision to press the button now, his brain had already decided it for him and he was merely doing what he had to do. Exactly. It appears to be a pretty uh, convincing argument for predetermination. Now, you might ask, well, okay, so Libet got this result. Can you always get that result? The answer is yes, you can, right? Uh, you found uh, another example where uh, oh, it was a TV program, right? Called Brains on Trial. Brains on Trial with Alan Alda. Yeah, and they, yeah, they they've reproduced this experiment yeah. many times. Uh, and some piano pieces are are so fast that you can't be, um, you can't be thinking while you do it. Uh, yeah. Especially if you're sight yeah. reading a uh, Rachmaninoff, you know. We've all had this experience in one way or another of uh, learning to do something and it becomes so habitual that we can't any longer analyze what we're doing. Uh, and if we had to do it consciously, we couldn't repeat it. Um, Alda himself in that um, uh, show remarks that he says, yes, I, I remember trying to analyze what I was doing when I was walking downstairs right. and I couldn't even figure out what various parts of my body were doing. And, uh, obviously, it was all predetermined in one way or another. It wasn't, uh, I may think that walking downstairs is a, is a conscious act, but in fact, it isn't. What's going on here? And the psychologist nods wisely and says, yes, it's 
It's an argument for determinism, all right. Right. So how do you get out of that one? Well, it occurs to me, I examined all this evidence fairly, fairly carefully, and as a matter of fact, I came across uh, another example on the Internet um, in which uh, some uh, British psychologist is um, uh, conducting the same experiment. Um, and uh, he gives his subject the same instructions, and she falls right into her hands. She remarks, it's weird waiting for the urge, isn't it? I thought, hmm, waiting for the urge. Now, in point of fact, the instructions for this experiment very specifically rule out making a conscious decision about when to do this. You're not allowed to look at your watch and say, okay, I'm going to press the button when the second hand hits two. Not allowed to do that. Right. That would be a rational decision and an act of free will, in a sense. Say, you make a decision, I'm going to press it when uh, it reaches two, and nobody tells you you have to do that. Nobody came up with the figure two. You did. Um, it's a conscious act. It's, a, uh, it's an act of free will, in, at least in popular understanding. However, that's been ruled out by the nature of the experiment. What the experiment demands is that you simply do it. And the subject says, I'm not allowed to, to decide rationally when to do it. How am I going to do this anyway? It's weird waiting for the urge, isn't it? She says. Right. All this is something similar, like uh, 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 Talia Wheatley says to him, um, uh, when you're preparing the act, you know, make note of when you're preparing the act. And he says to her, what do you mean preparing the act? You've told me not to prepare the act. Um, in fact, what determines when these subjects press the button is a subconscious urge. So why are we surprised that the subconscious urge comes first? It doesn't prove a thing. Okay, so you're saying that's not an argument for determinism, or is it a partial argument for determinism? It's, because not, a, it's not an argument against free will, because in fact the, the rules of the experiment rule out free will to begin with. Okay, so, so we're getting to a, a model wherein we're saying, well, some things can be subconscious urges that are somehow predetermined, but other things can maybe be free will um, in a different way. And can we, let's take it back to the tennis match, which yeah. is my favorite example, my... my way of countering David Eagleman, um, mm. which is you say, you know, yeah, they're moving so fast that they can't possibly be making free choice decisions and, and thinking through yeah, there's every no movement question, and every stroke. There's no question that 99% of the moves that a tennis player will make on the tennis court are subconscious, uh, somehow or other um, uh, conditioned responses. Okay. But what's the other 1%? Yeah, exactly. Or 0.001% perhaps. And our argument is that the other 1% is all you need to have free will. For instance, that tennis player, I, I put this argument to you, that tennis player uh, may very well be doing almost everything uh, on the court like an automaton. Yes. And as a matter of fact, if you get tired and pressed and sweaty and a little confused playing tennis, you will act like an automaton. You'll lose your grip on that uh, conscious free choice level and, and just play and you'll make mistakes or you'll do things that weren't the best thing to do and mm. so on uh, because you will be pretty much just an automaton the trick is to keep that 1% level of conscious um, analysis of what you're doing and say hmm my opponent's backhand appears to be weaker than her forehand, I'm going to direct all my shots as much as I can to her backhand, and you can do that. And that's all you really do in, in winning a tennis match, is that little bit of strategy. Mm -hmm. Sure, the rest of it's all automatic. It has to be. You can't possibly think about every move you're going to make. You're not going to think about how you flex your toe as you take your one no. stride forward toward the net and you got to remember to breathe and don't no. forget to breathe yeah, that's right. <laughs> and then don't forget to 
um, keep your blood circulating, because yeah. well, then you'd die if you forgot to circulate your blood. So, so yeah. the argument is that, yes, a lot of it is... Uh, most of it. Most of it is mm-hmm. automaton. And then I, I would go further back, and I would say, but why did they decide to play tennis? And did they spend time reviewing their video matches with their coach, you know, over the past 12 so years? So the question is, where did all this automatic uh, activity come from? Mm. Well, a lot of it came from conscious choice, eh? So you were you got up one morning and you said, "Oh, I don't want to play tennis today." And you thought about it and you said, "No, you know, I'm I'm really determined to be a top-level tennis player. I've got my meeting with my coach at 8. We're going to go in and we're going to review my videos." And this was 6 years ago, but that that slower, more deliberate choice fed into the eventual tennis match. So we're saying, "Yes, a lot of the tennis match is automatic." But you made some deliberate choices that fed into that automaticity um, mm. later on. And so there's this, this constant tiny bit of uh, modeling that is happening in the brain, this, this uh, teleodynamic modeling where you say, well, what do I want to be and do I really want to be it? And that iteration allows for um, a tiny little bit of free choice. And I'm big on this. Th- this is... Our brain scans aren't great um, compared to how, uh, you know, tiny and complex the brain Mm. is. The things that we can do with functional magnetic resonance imaging and electroencephalograms and, you know, looking at blood flow and, and, uh, you know, magnetic and and electrical activity are not particularly precise. Um, But we have found some interesting things up there. and one of the articles that we cite is by Hudetz and a number of other authors in 2016. And they looked at um, rats when they're unconscious and conscious versus humans uh, when they're unconscious and they're conscious. And in humans, uh, what you see is that when the brain is online, conscious, awake, not anesthetized, um, uh, you know, be it by virtue of being asleep or by virtue of having been anesthetized, um, there is more networked activity. Um, there is, uh, there is a greater amount of, um, signaling happening, uh, between the various networks in the brain, uh, when conscious than when asleep. And in rats, uh, there isn't, uh, to the same degree. And, and so with rats, when they're conscious, um, they don't have as much, electrical network act or they don't have more electrical and network activity happening in their brain than they do when they're asleep. And so one of the arguments that you could make, and again, this is all really, you know, our, our, as I say, our scans aren't that precise, but you could take that and you could say, oh, interesting. Is it that when somebody is conscious, when a human is conscious, there's more of this reciprocal, um, you know, modeling and, and signaling um, uh, happening. And I, I, I think I also uh, cite a, a Jordan Peterson lecture in the paper where he's trying to explain what consciousness is, you know, having the same difficulty because our, it's just a hard thing to wrap your head around. But he says, you know, if you take a video camera and you point it at a television and, and then you have the television display what, is, what the video camera is recording, very quickly strange things start to happen because you have this signal that is reciprocating between the two screens so quickly. And it's the same as when you get a feedback loop, if you get too close to a microphone uh, and that audio is projecting into the room, the signal kind of compounds and it starts doing pretty wacky things. And so one of the ways that you could think about consciousness is that it's this this kind of cycle of a lot of electrical activity happening up in the brain uh, and perhaps you know, where you are uh, modeling, where you're doing something, you know, genuinely, you know, teleodynamic, um, because you're creating a a, a model of the reality that you wish to inhabit, and you're comparing that against, you know, all of the rest of what you know, Mm. and that maybe that's why, you know, Again, a, a human who's awake is different from so, a rat who's awake, because maybe the rat is more reactive. Somehow or other, uh, consciousness, is, as it appears in human beings at any rate, and we have every reason to believe that the consciousness of your dog or your cat is much the same, um, 
uh, is a matter of a kind of overview. It's a, it's a, um, it's another level of emergent phenomenon in brain activity that that reviews other activities in the brain. Um, and the argument that I would make there, having to do with the dog and the cat, um, is an interesting one. So is a dog conscious? I would say, well, not as conscious as a human, because a dog can't model uh, and represent in the same way as a human can. And then if you said to me, and this, is, this gets a little dark, but if you said, are all humans equally conscious? There, I would say no. I would say that a human who watches a lot of TV and does what the TV tells them to do yeah. is less conscious because they're not, they're following... Well, um, and by the same token, any one individual human being is more conscious sometimes than others, even if they're awake. So the tennis player who's just, you know, full on and flurried or, or if you're, you know, running late and you don't have time to think on a particular day, yeah. you might do a lot of things automatically. So it's really when you actually take the time... Mm. to think uh, and you you, yeah. you know you create those reciprocal signals in that action of modeling in the same way as the cell phone was built the Notre Dame Cathedral mm. was built that you become more conscious yeah that tennis player <clears throat> when they have a bad day are really is really less conscious than on a good day uh, less conscious of everything they're doing and the implications of everything they're doing it's a, it's a very complex process. And of course, this points up another principle that I consider to be very important with regard to virtually every aspect of uh, intelligent human life, and, and that is that uh, nothing is actually simply a matter of kind. Uh, this relates actually to Alfred North Whitehead's process philosophy and uh, organic realism and so on. Um, we tend habitually to think of things in categories because that's the way our brains work and that's the way language developed. Um, um, there's no such thing in reality as a tree. There are only particular trees. There's a particular birch tree, but what is a tree tree? It, there's no tree tree. Platonic. A, a tree is an abstract category. Ideals. Okay. Right? Um, so our brains work that way. We tend to, we tend to box things and say, oh, yeah, that's a tree. And that's a table, and so on. But there are a billion different kinds of tables. Some have three legs, some have five legs, some are octagonal, some are square, some are rectangular, on and on and on. There, nothing exists in reality but a particular table. Well, um, uh, the, the point is that we falsely force reality into all these categories, but in fact... Everything is a kind of a continuum. Um, consciousness is a continuum from complete uh, lack of anything that we would call cognizant awareness to Alfred North Whitehead writing philosophy papers about organic realism. Mm. Um, it's a progression. And at the very top, you have ideal human consciousness. Tennis player on a bad day, not much consciousness, hmm. right? You know they're walking around and so on, but... I find this, this idea interesting, the notion of ideal human consciousness, and, and I'm going to... This is going to get abstract modeling and, you know, infinite yeah. involved, but I kind of think, you know, okay, so you're conscious... The argument that I'm making is something like you're conscious to the degree that you can abstractly model uh, reality and meditate on um, what you want to do within it and, and how that will kind of uh, affect the system. And so the ultimate consciousness would be some kind of, you know, omniscience um, mm -hmm. that nobody can approach and, and we can't even get you know, anywhere close to it. Um, but we, you know, we kind of do our best and we come up with ideas that eventually turn into cell phones and, you know, hitting the shot to the other person mm. in the backhand. Um, but it's still pretty far. I mean, it's still incredibly far from, um, being able to understand how everything works and, you know, achieve 
uh, anything that we want, you know, within reality, that would be, that would be Laplace's yeah. demon, or you know, or or even to get near that for a human being is, um, yeah. Perhaps we we've been talking a lot about um, modeling, and uh, perhaps we should mention here uh, Hawking and ah uh, uh, yes, Ludmov. Uh, I think that's how you pronounce his name. Spelled M L O D I N O W. I guess that's Ludmov. Okay. Uh, Hawking is one of my great heroes. Um, how that man managed to survive Lou Gehrig's disease for decades and at the same time become one of the world's greatest philo- uh, physicists is a mystery to everyone. Sure. Uh, had an incredible mind. Uh, in, in company with another uh, a scientist, and I don't exactly know what, the, what their roles were in, in writing uh, the book, but uh, they wrote a book um, called can't call something that. like the grand design. The grand design. Yeah, it's the grand design. In it, uh, they begin by saying, "In in this book, we're going to adopt an approach which we call uh, model dependent realism." And when I uh, read that phrase, I, my ears pricked up, and I thought, "Hmm, I think I know what this is going to be about." And uh, sure enough, I liked what they had to say that. Their basic approach is that, uh, their basic assumption is that uh, scientists tend to fail to realize that uh, any scientific theory is a model as opposed to a direct counterpart of reality. Um, And as a matter of fact, the idea can be expanded to almost any um, application. Uh, Virtually any abstract idea that the human mind possesses is a model of reality. And in fact, uh, those models are always to one degree or another distinct from reality itself. Uh, For instance, they are almost always simplified, uh, not as complex as the real phenomena. Sure. Um, And um, Hawking says the problem is that when a science identifies a theory that works or that has practical applications, they tend to assume that that theory in every implication and every aspect is the direct counterpart of reality uh, and therefore draw conclusions from it which may be erroneous. So we had the, the Zeno's paradox with Achilles, where Achilles can never catch the turtle. Yeah, we have the uh, infinite regression of uh, back to the Big Bang. Yeah, Newtonian physics not being able to explain, uh, you know, why things have accreted somewhat randomly in the mm. actual universe. Now it occurred to me, as I was reading this, uh, since my background is fundamentally arts and uh, and literature that what Hawking was talking about was taking metaphors literally. Hmm. Taking a scientific theory to be the direct counterpart of reality is the same thing, metaphorically speaking, as a metaphor in literature. Um, I use a simple example of, um, let's say, let's say I say, um, Buddy is a real pig, by which I mean he's very messy, right? Now, messy is an abstract concept, and so in order to give this abstract concept of a readily understandable reality, I use the metaphor pig, hmm. because we have this notion that pigs are messy. That's not fair to pigs. It's a, it's our our methods of farming pigs that's messy, but never mind that. So, uh, if in fact I make the mistake of taking that metaphor literally and assuming that but he really is a pig, then it follows that he must have a curly tail concealed under his trousers, that his nose is a little flatter than most people's, that he oinks when he talks and so on and so forth, Uh, which would be silly. But in fact, um, that would be the direct counterpart of assuming that a scientific theory was was an accurate description of reality in every respect. Uh, when in fact there is always a difference between a scientific theory, which is abstract, 
and the reality that it attempts to describe. Sometimes there's a big discrepancy, uh, and only one small part of the theory really applies to reality. Mm. Um, just as in the metaphor of Buddy the pig, mm -hmm. only one small aspect of our friend, whoever his real name is, and we won't be specific, um, only one small part of his behavior, namely that he tends to be a bit messy, mm -hmm. has anything whatsoever to do with pigs. Um, <clears throat> other than that, the term pig is utterly uh, inapplicable. Okay. Uh, now, if it is to, if if what Hawking and Mladenov are saying is true, and scientific theories are in fact a kind of metaphor in that sense, and in fact science takes tends to take those metaphors literally, uh, and draw conclusions from them that uh, may not really be applicable to reality, all of a sudden we have a ready explanation for Zeno's paradoxes and for all kinds of weird conclusions that science tends to come to. Um, hard determinism? Hard determinism being one of them. Right. Quite possibly uh, aspects of the of the model which seem to dictate hard, hard determinism really don't apply to reality. 